Hello everyone, Mark here once again with a bucket load of tips for Dawn of Man, my favourite prehistoric settlement building game. All these tips are designed to either ease new players into the game or just to let you enjoy the game more when you're playing. And of course, if you're already experienced at Dawn of Man, then do please feel free to add your top tip in the comments down below. As ever, if you'd like to learn more about the game, then do check the links in the description to my other videos. Okay, before we get into the main categories, here's a couple of quality of life tips that'll just make things a little bit faster and a little bit easier for you. If you want to select all the items of the same type on the screen, for example, all the patches of this field of crops, then just double click on one of them. The same applies to domestic animals as well. So you could select, say, all your cows if you wanted to do a mass slaughter of the ones just on the screen. There are limits to this, it does have a range limit and also a maximum number of items limit, but it is pretty useful to get jobs done quickly. And the second general tip is at the start of the game, keep your population low on purpose. Don't get too big until you've developed a little bit of farming and agriculture, because all of a sudden if you get a big population and all the animals start to run away and there's nothing left to hunt, you're going to have mass starvation. Trust me, I learnt it the hard way. Okay, let's talk about hunting first, something you're going to be doing from the very beginning of the game. When you would like to select a party of villagers to go hunting, hold down the H key on the keyboard before dragging the mouse around, say, four to five and selecting them. That way, you'll only select villagers who are suitable for the hunting party. Very useful because people who can't partake in the hunt are better off staying in the village and getting on with other tasks. Now, whilst you can set up work zones and assign villagers to go and hunting them, I don't find that this is very efficient, and you're missing out on one of the more fun aspects of the game. So I prefer to go on manual hunts. Holding down the H key on the keyboard, select four to five hunters, and then send them off on mass expeditions, controlling them all the way. By choosing four to five villagers, you will find that you take down animals very quickly and rarely take any damage in return. The animals don't get time to run away, and you won't end up chasing them all around the map trying to finish them off and you can just manually target one after another after another. Hold down the tab key which pauses the game and gives you a nice overview of the resources on the map so you can clearly see where the animals in the game are through all the trees and undergrowth. Go on a mass killing rampage like this for as long as you want. Don't worry about harvesting it. Villagers will come back from the main settlement and come and harvest the hides and meat and bones whilst you're busy off exterminating whatever race of animals you've found. Try to make enough bows in the village for everyone. I like to set it to 100%. Bows are fantastic weapons for hunting because they are quick to shoot, they've got the good range, and you will take down animals very, very fast. They're also very good for defending the settlement against raiders as well. But if all your villagers have a bow when they go hunting, then they won't need to close into close range with the animal to be able to shoot it from range, even as it runs off, and you will save a lot of time and energy. And finally, if you see any aggressive packs of animals out there, things like bears, lions, wolves, or their different iterations throughout the ages, go and hunt them down if they're coming near any of your work zones or even near the village. You don't want a stray villager getting picked off by a bear. And besides, you can eat them and wear them, so you may as well go and do it. All aggressive should be taken out like this if they're getting close, but wolf pups, well, you can actually domesticate those, and I'll talk more about that later on. Okay, moving on to resources and gathering now. And whilst you can tell your villagers to go manually gather anything like a little pile of stones or some flint deposit that's laying on the floor, it's a lot more efficient to set up work zones. And when you set up a zone for gathering anything, make sure you set an appropriate number of workers and an appropriate resource limit for it too. For example, you set up a flint zone and if you set the limit to 10 pieces, then someone will always go and work that zone until you have 10 pieces of flint in stock. And if your tool producers are using flint and that depletes, well, they'll keep topping it up until it remains at 10. However, if, for example, you want a huge amount of resources, say you've just developed stone defences and you need a ton of stone, just set it to infinite and your workers will harvest the entire zone until it's all gone. And the number of workers you set to a zone should be appropriate to your needs as well. Don't set more people working a zone than you really need the resource coming in. If you set a percentage in this zone, then it'll gather that percentage of your current population total. That can actually be more useful as your settlement starts to grow. Resources like stone and flint are used up when they're gathered, but trees do regenerate anywhere randomly over an open green space, so feel free to chop down as many as you like. But don't forget where you've set your tannin gathering zones. Tannin is gathered from trees and used to produce leather. And if you go and accidentally chop down all the trees in a tannin zone, well, you're going to have trouble producing leather for a little while. A mistake I have made on a couple of occasions. 
And when you're placing a work zone, don't forget you can change the size of it using the Z and C keys on an English layout keyboard. Okay, on to technology and a few tips to help you gain some easy knowledge points, which is going to be essential, especially playing on hardcore mode. In this game, you pick up knowledge points just for doing stuff, gathering stuff, and the more of you gather, the more you hunt, the more you build of any particular thing, the more knowledge points you will gain. But if you want to pick up some very easy knowledge points, here's a dead simple way to do it. And you can do this right from the beginning of the game. Make sure to hunt at least one of every type of animal. Yes, you'll get more knowledge points if you hunt lots of a particular animal, but the first time you hunt any animal that you haven't hunted before, you'll get a knowledge point. And this doesn't just apply at the beginning of the game either. As new animals appear as you move throughout the ages, make sure to hunt at least one of them, and preferably multiples, for some nice easy points to gain research with. And the same kind of thing applies to buildings as well. Make sure you build at least one of every building, and preferably five or ten or more. Again, you'll gain knowledge points the first time you build a brand new structure. And hey, exactly the same principle applies to tools and weapons as well. I like to build these in multiples of fives or tens, especially early on, and then you get some nice, easy knowledge points. Now another way of getting technology is to trade for it as well, which we'll talk about during the trade section. So keep an eye on for that and don't research something if you feel that you don't really need it just that instant, because it might show up with a trader and you might be able to pick it up for a good deal. So make sure to focus your research points into the areas that you really want to progress. Now something to think about before you get too far into any game is your town layout. You always need to plan for expansion and growth. At the beginning of the game, when you've just got a few huts and things, it's not really too important. But look at the area around your starting position. Is it going to be big enough when it's all cleared to get the size of town that you want for the end of the game? If not, then look at areas around, maybe on the other side of the river or just over those mountains, because it might be worth relocating or at least building all new structures in the new area when you find one that's big enough. And that might involve clearing a few trees, but plan it out from the start because it'll be better to do it that way than have a real pain of a job later on trying to demolish everything and relocate. Now, one of the general rules for building a town is that fields, haystacks, and storage piles for wood and stone can generally go outside the walls, and all your other buildings want to be inside, where they're going to be safe and protected. So if you've got the room, it's no problem building a few fields inside the walls early on, but by the end of the game, you want all your agriculture outside, because you're going to need all that space inside the walls for your own residences and buildings and crafters and blacksmiths, etc, etc. And why do we want the fields and stuff outside the walls? Because you need to keep the town as compact as possible for defence. That way it's easier to get walls all the way around the settlement, but most importantly it's a lot easier for your villagers to defend it if it's small than if it's some massive sprawling epic thing with hundreds of guard towers and loads of gates to try and defend. Also, when you're thinking about the town layout, just have in mind where the storerooms and storehouses need to be in relation to where the resources are coming in from. For example, if you've got all the fields of barley and grain on one side of the settlement, then put the granaries just inside the gates on that side, and your villagers won't have that far to come and drop stuff off when they're coming and bringing in the harvest. And the same goes for mining and rocks and wood and everything else if you've got the location set out and it's obvious where the resources are coming from try and make the storage piles and warehouses nearer where the resources are going to be delivered to also to save space try and put smaller structures like totem poles and guard towers and things like that right up against city walls because you know you can't use that space necessarily for a bigger structure like a roundhouse if you've got little gaps in between a couple of houses or a couple of buildings in there, try and fill it with anything that'll go in. The little religious structures are actually quite good for that and just, you know, use a bit more space efficiently so you've got more room for blacksmiths and industry later on inside the walls. Okay, agriculture, one of my favourite parts of the game. Remember that tip I said right at the start of the video about being able to select multiple items of the same type by double clicking on one? Well, it comes in really useful here. So your field of barley, or whatever crop you like, double click on one patch of it and it will select multiple patches of that field. If it's a full size field that you've made, it won't select all, so you'll need to do this in opposite corners to do it all. But then you can set them all to high priority with a click of a button. That means that sowing that field 
and harvesting that field, more importantly, will become a high priority task to your villagers, meaning they won't be going off doing other stupid useless tasks and missing the window in spring and autumn or whenever the crops happen to be sown to get that job done. This is very, very important, especially if you're ever on the cusp of not having quite enough workers or enough food coming in to feed everyone over the winter. It just means sure that your crops are gonna get harvested with priority before they go off doing other jobs. Also try and vary the type of crops that you're planting as well. That way you won't be quite as hard hit if you get a disease on your main crop. And these diseases will pop up from time to time, hammering you pretty hard if you've planted all crops of one type and it gets diseased, well, that might be a harsh winter coming up. But vary it a little bit and you'll protect yourself against that. Also, the different types of cereal have different benefits in regards to their straw production or their grain production. So it does pay to vary a little bit. Now, whilst cereals and grains are going to be your main source of food, which produce flour and then produce bread, you should also plant some pulses as well. This effectively splits the workload because whereas cereals are planted in spring and harvested in autumn, pulses are planted in winter and harvested in summer. So you can effectively double the workload by splitting the type of crops. Don't forget to put in a field of flax as soon as you can as well because the linen it produces is very useful for summer clothing, other items and has quite a nice trade value. And make sure that you're always producing enough to satisfy the demands of a growing population. Now when it comes to domesticating livestock, well really you can take any number of approaches that suit you, but there's one thing that is absolutely essential and that is sheep. You need them for wool and you need the wool for that winter clothing. They're very useful. Also wool is quite valuable as a trade resource even late into the game. So you definitely need to domesticate sheep. Other than that, the choices are really up to you. You can domesticate pigs, which will produce you a lot of food. Oh, and all these ones butchered will produce hide and bone as well. I found the pigs took a lot of effort to micromanage. They produced really fast and needed culling quite often. I preferred cattle, which also produce milk, have a long productive life, or at least seem to, and just seem to be a little bit easier to manage. Goats are kind of something in between which can be butchered for meat or kept to produce milk, but I found it easiest focusing on sheep and cattle. Naturally, you'll also want to go and domesticate horses and donkeys when you get the relevant techs, so you can build carts and increase your villager's productivity. Now, if you're running out of living space in your stables and you've got too many animals, you might find micromanaging all your herd a little bit easier. Make sure to go and cull out any animal that's got the title old. And a lot of the time, you won't need most of the males. Yeah, sorry, fellas, you're not required. So you can kill the males, you can kill the old ones. As long as you keep one male, you should be able to produce more. Or if micromanaging isn't your thing, then just zoom out a little bit, double click on one of your animals. Remember that selects all the ones on the same screen or at least nearby, and then just hit the slaughter button and go for a mass cull. And be careful you don't kill too many like that. You'll have to go and find some more wild ones and domesticate them. But you know, if you're short on time and patience, it works. Also, don't bother having more animals than you really need because they will eat all your supply of straw over the winter. Yeah, animals need food and water over winter, but not over summer, and they live off the straw that comes out of your fields. However, that straw is also vital for building houses. It's the thatch for the roof. So if you find that you're always running out of straw, check and make sure you don't have too many animals. They do produce on their own, and it can get out of hand. Now, another type of animal that isn't quite as productive, but is very useful to get are wolf pups. Once you've got the technology in the start of the game to go and domesticate dogs, you can actually go out and manually target wolf pups to be tamed by your villagers. Their parents don't seem to mind for some reason. Domesticate all that you can because, you know, then there's less wolves out there to attack you. And also as domestic dogs, they don't require any maintenance from you. They live off scraps. They don't require anything and they will defend your property against raiders and even animal attacks should it get close enough to the village. All right, let's talk about production, crafting and tool making. If you suddenly find yourself in a shortage of any particular tool or crafted item, then you can click on the building and set it to high priority. This will cause your villagers to drop other tasks that they're doing and make sure that this task gets done first, as long as the required resources are available. I like to set all my crafting onto autopilot mode, so it'll just create the required amount. 
in the case of clothing that we've just been talking about, set this to 125%. Yes, I know, that means it'll make more clothes than you have villagers, but here's why. It gives you some extra ones for when new villagers suddenly turn up. They may turn up in winter, they will complain if they don't have any warm clothing. Having a little bit of extra clothing in stock will allow for new villagers coming in and settling, and also gives you a couple of things to trade should you need to, because they are worth quite a bit. Make sure to set tool limits as well, and this can be down to your personal preference, but for example, I think that everybody needs a knife, so I set that to 100%. I also set it to 100% for bows as well, because I like all my people to have bows. I know the children won't pick them up, but you've got a few spare then, and once again, in case of new villagers coming in. And the same with sickles as well. Workload increases dramatically once you start planting crops. So make sure everyone's got a sickle and try and make it so that everyone's got the best sickle available because that does increase their proficiency. Other weapons and tools, well, you know, that's down to your own personal playstyle. But either set a hard number at the beginning of the game, that can be useful, or set it as a percentage of the population limit. I tend to stick it to either 50, 75 or 100 percentage. The only time I go over that is with the clothing as mentioned earlier. Now, whilst auto production can be very useful, don't forget to go and turn it off on things that have been out teched. For example, once you get bronze, especially, you really don't want your villagers wasting their time making flint and bone tools. Pay special attention to when you get wool and linen clothing. If you have enough, then don't waste any more leather and skins making the old styles because that leather and skins will be very useful for other things. More importantly with the metalworking is to stop producing copper ingots once you've developed bronze. You may as well put the ore into that and get a better product at the end of it. And the same with iron once you get steel. Okay, it's time to get serious now and talk about defence. What can you do when the inevitable raider attack comes in? Well, first off, when you hear the alarm, go up to the defence menu at the top right and make sure you click on the horn. That will call everyone back into the village. They'll run back, they'll grab weapons if they can fight, they'll take shelter if they can't. But you're still gonna need weapons to defend, so make sure you're building enough. I prefer to have a bow and a weapon for every member of the tribe, so I set production limits on those to 100% of the population. That might seem a little bit overkill considering that children won't pick up weapons and fight, but at least that way you're always gonna have plenty. And I like to sell off older weapons when we've developed a new technology because that encourages the crafters to build more of the newer type, which are always better. But even an old out-of-date weapon is better than no weapon at all, so make sure you've got enough. Now, after you've experienced a couple of the earlier small raider attacks, you'll know roughly what direction they're going to come from in the future. So, build a gate on that side of your settlement in the walls there, and I like to put at least three towers either side of the gate. Massing the towers in this way will mean that you've got mass firepower when the raiders come in in their mob at the right place facing the right direction. And it's more effective than dotting towers individually around the walls, which is what I initially did and found that they were taken down very easily by mobs of raiders. Now, when you've got an attack coming in, you've hit the alarm. Your villagers have run off to grab weapons and lots of them have run into the guard towers. You find out where the attack's coming from and then you may notice that a lot of your villagers are hiding in the guard towers on the wrong side of the settlement. Well, make sure to go and select all those guard towers. You can drag the mouse around them all and select the empty button and your villagers will come running out and then you can quickly select them and tell them to go to the side of the village where the attack's coming. If you suddenly find yourself short of villagers, go and check the guard towers that aren't being attacked. They may be in those. Now, building walls around the settlement is generally a good idea. Not only does it look nice, but it will slow attackers down and you can use the walls to funnel attackers into specific locations. You can also build them outside your main settlement. Do it near gates and guard towers. This can actually be quite good because you can break up an attack when the raiders come, they usually come in a big mob. Well, if you leave a few sections of wall and a gate by themselves outside the main settlement, they may get distracted with them. Some will start attacking them just to tear them down. Other raiders will branch off and come and attack your main settlement. You've split up the group. You can deal with two smaller groups a lot easier than one big group. So if you find you're getting big groups of raiders and you're struggling to cope with them, try building little bits of extra defences, just walls and things out of the way in front of where their attacks come from. You might find it just breaks it up a bit and distracts them so you can pick them off a little bit easier. And now a few quick tips on trade. 
When the trader comes in and you double click on them to see what they've got, always check to see what their commission rate is at the top of the screen. You want to avoid making big purchases from traders with high commission because you'll be paying a lot. So don't buy things like technology from them unless you are absolutely heaving with spare resources. Try and trade for items that you can make something better out of. For example, you can trade for bones quite cheaply early on and turn them into bone spears or bone harpoons, which are worth quite a bit more, at least until metal weapons come along. Do try and pick up technology from traders if it's going to be feasible. For example, if a trader comes in with low commission and they've got a new technology that you want, if you have a load of gear that you can get rid of that you don't really need, then, well, that saves using the knowledge points for it, and you can use those points to research something else. This is very handy on hardcore mode when the enemy raiders will be teching up potentially faster than you. And a good way of actually affording those technologies is to get rid of tools and items that are not going to be worth very much once the next technology comes along. For example, by the time you get bronze working, bronze swords and spears, your bone and flint spears are going to be worthless. So try and trade all those away when they're worth 10 apiece to get some good stuff or maybe some technology. And then when you get to the bronze age, you'll find that they're worthless. So you don't want a big stock of them by that point. Get rid of stuff whilst it's worth something. That if you can afford to of course and you don't desperately need those items for the defense of your village the same applies to slings and bows as well by the time composite bows come along regular bows aren't worth very much and guess what that also applies to the older types of skin and leather clothing by the time wool and linen comes in in other words sell it while it's hot well, those are my top tips for Dawn of Man, which I have thoroughly enjoyed playing. If you've also played and got some great advice that I've missed or got completely wrong, then please do share it down below. That would be awesome. And if you haven't played yet, but would like to check out some more videos of mine on the game, then check the links down below for either my review or my full playthrough. Once again, folks, thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll catch you again on the next one.